the Wade Center's podcast. The podcast of Wheaton College. We just acquired a book at the Wade Center that Lewis owned called Heimskringla, which means the circle of the heavens in uh, Icelandic. Huh. And it's written by Snorri Sturluson, who wrote the Elder oh, Eddas and the okay. Poetic Eddas, which is the, all the, the old Icelandic tellings yeah. of Norse myth. It mentions a, a warrior named Treebeard, and there's also a dwarf named Durin. Whoa. So I think that uh, this book, which is actually owned by C.S. Lewis, is also a source book for The Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, this is wow. one of the most exciting things the, the Wade has acquired. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. We are continuing our series on Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. And today we're going to be discussing book three, which is the first half of The Two Towers. So maybe we should start and um, maybe we should start with introducing ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> you always forget to do that. <laughs> yeah. I know. Um, we have three towers here, three towers of intellect. <laughs> I am Dr. Crystal Downing, co-director of the Wade Center, and I'm joined by my husband, my fellow co-director of the Wade Center, Dr. David Downing, and our producer, Aaron Hill, to continue our conversation. And now we will go to this title, Two Towers. David, can you comment on that? What do you think are the two towers? And are they part of this book three, the first half? Uh, as we mentioned earlier, Tolkien didn't originally conceive this as a trilogy. It's really not a trilogy. It's one continuous story. But, the but then he divided asked, it in six yeah, books. He did divide it into six books, but the publishers asked him to break it into three books. So they, they wanted to call books three and four The Two Towers, which Tolkien didn't necessarily like because he said, which two towers, as you just asked? Uh -huh. uh, well, it seems because there's five towers in this story. I guess so, yeah. I mean, it seems self-explanatory, but what are the five towers, David? Well, there's Baradur, uh, there is Minas Tirith, uh -huh. there is Orthanc, mm -hmm. And then there's a tower at Helm's Deep where, right. uh, oh. and there's actually a fifth one that I'm not remembering right now. Oh, there's the, besides Baradur, there's the Tower of Watching that has also been taken over by uh, Mordor. And oh. so he actually thought a better title for the second book of the trilogy would be The Shadow Lengthens. Oh. But he drew a picture of the two towers, and you can tell from his own picture, it was the cover of the original edition, oh. that he was thinking of Baradur, Sauron's tower, uh -huh. and Orthanc, which is Saruman's tower. Okay. So, Crystal, yeah. when you said we have three towers, the two towers in the title are both evil. Okay. So when you said we're three towers today, I just want you to know that has <laughs> kind of a well, sinister I'll evil. connotation. I'll, I'll be the good one. You guys can <laughs> okay, be the evil okay. one. So that's <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this, those are the two towers. Yeah. There are well, many towers. High places tend to be very important yeah. in these stories. Well, that, and I was going to say it does. Uh, it does end. Uh, the book three ends very clearly with a focus on the two towers, which not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but it, I mean, so it does feel fitting for the for the book itself. Uh, yes, and some people think that when he where he grew up grew up in a village in Birmingham him called Sarah Hall, there was a water tower and another ugly tower, which oh. kind of spoiled the landscape of this turn of the century British village. Oh. Some people think that he had this memory of these two ugly towers uh, growing up in Sarah Hall that may have gotten into. Oh, and hence the aligning them towers. with the two mm. evil characters. And that accompanies something he is quite explicit about in book three. Three, because he clearly makes the heroes value trees. Oh, yeah. Versus Saruman, part of his evil is manifest that his orcs chop down trees, destroy right. trees. And so for Tolkien, and he shared this with C.S. Lewis, the industrialism of England was destroying the beauty of the countryside. Right. Treebeard says the Saruman has a mind of metal and wheels. And just those industrial images remind you again how much Tolkien, as well as Lewis, really did not like the products of industrialism. They yeah. wish they could stay in a much simpler say, world. I was going to say, in the chapter, The Road to Isengard, uh, there was a whole paragraph that I placed a line next to and wrote at the top, The Wounds of Industry. And right. he says, uh, Iron wheels revolve there endlessly and hammers thudded. At night, plumes of vapor steam from the vents, lit from beneath with red light or blue or venomous green. Right. And so he, he just, he, he depicts how industry and progress 
and it just it, it inevitably leads to the destruction of trees and nature and and you just have these people credited in these sad little houses and steam pouring out of chimneys and fires right and, right. right sounds like something out of dickens doesn't it yeah right. Right. very much so right hard times and immediately after that passage you read Aaron it says there stood a tower and that's the tower yeah. of Sarah man this evil Poor person yeah. Yeah. yeah well let's get back to the beginning uh, the the book starts out with the departure of Boromir I would, I would like to say that was the most quickly we got on a digression that we've done in our podcast. <laughs> yeah, this is true, yeah. It took us less than five minutes to yeah. get yes, off track. Yes, but we have to handle this question of why it's called the Two Towers. That's so, true. That's yeah. true. Um, it is not easily answered. Okay, Back thank to Boromir. you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, well, Boromir is killed uh, fighting the orcs, and the, the scene is very similar to the uh, Song of Roland, the great hero with the horn who blows his horns. Uh, there's a medieval poem about... Oh, that's the, a, the French hero. Yeah. The Song of Roland. Yeah, the Song of Roland. Exactly. Okay. And he blows Which, the horn. Which, by the to way, get... Dorothy Sayers translated. Oh, I bet From... you guys could probably find that if you search online, the Song of Roland. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's it's available uh, on Gutenberg. Okay. Uh, but he dies up against a tree after blowing a horn to try to get Charlemagne to come rescue him from the, these are Basque in the Pyrenees. Uh but as getting away from Roland, the funeral where they don't have time to build a cairn, so they put him in the boat and they put all the shields and yeah. the arrows of his enemies in it. Uh, that's straight out of Beowulf. The opening scene of Beowulf is a funeral where they're sit- oh, yeah, sitting in the right. boat out to sea. Yeah. And remind our listeners when Beowulf would have been written. Beowulf is a ninth century Anglo-Saxon poem, apparently an old pagan legend, which has been overlaid by a Christian writer. Mm. And uh, actually... Tolkien liked that formula. In many ways, Middle Earth, The Lord of the Rings, is a kind of pagan tale without references to worship or Christ, but mm. it has uh, Christian faith suffused in the story and the symbolism, Tolkien said. So in many ways, he's imitating the Beowulf poet when he right. d- Doesn't, writes Lord of the Rings. did Tolkien do, do something with Beowulf? Oh, he did everything with Beowulf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he did a classic translation. He wrote a poem called Beowulf, the Monster and the Critics, which totally changed Beowulf studies. Oh, wow. It had been considered to be a linguistic document that was interesting, but not very literarily sophisticated. Oh. Because it has three episodes. It doesn't fill in the whole story. We have uh, Beowulf killing Grindel and then killing Grindel's mother Mm -hmm. and then finally uh, dying and fighting a dragon. Yeah. And people said, well, it's kind of disjointed, but it has a lot of interesting literary artifacts. Uh And he said, no, no, this is a work of literature. This is... Beowulf, the great hero in his prime, and then the great mm. hero in the height of his powers, yeah. and, and then the hero dying at the sunset of his. So he wrote this poem, which really turned Beowulf into a literary masterpiece rather than a linguistic doctor. Huh. That was probably why I had to read Beowulf when I was in school. Uh, yeah, it may, it may be Tolkien's fault. Okay. All right. No, I mean, I, I, I like the story. I thought, I thought it was actually very good. Um, yeah. Well, a lot of the words, the orcs comes from uh, Beowulf and ints comes from Beowulf. A lot of these words and the writers of Rowan, when we get to them, they literally speak Anglo-Saxon. Their names oh. and their their pledges to each other, their, when they hail each other and say, Furthu Hall, that means literally fare thee whole or fare thee whale, oh. like hale and hearty. So that's not a language that Tolkien made up at that point. He no, just it's, borrowed. it's direct Anglo-Saxon. Oh, okay. But it's the West Midlands dialect of Anglo-Saxon, which oh, wow. he liked. That was the area where he grew up. So it's a little linguistic joke. You're supposed to go, that's not regular Anglo-Saxon. That's the West Midlands dialect. <laughs> Oh, I yeah. recognize that immediately. Yeah, exactly. Those yeah. philology, philology <laughs> yeah. jokes, they always land, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I was going to say in this chapter, I wanted to mention a couple things. Uh, when they're trying to discern where the hobbits, you know, what happened to the hobbits and where everything's right. gone, um, it stood out to me, Gimli says, maybe there is no right choice. And right. there's this sense in which, well, we just have to commit to a path and we may not have certainty, but we just have to make a decision and follow that because if we wait until we have certainty, it'll be, it'll be too late. Uh, and so I, I thought it was interesting that Tolkien sort of takes a moment in this opening chapter and gives us an insight, a little vignette into the character of each of them. So there's that moment for Gimli. And then I was going to mention uh, Aragorn when they send off Boromir. He says, the last words of Boromir, he long kept secret. And mm. so I thought there was a very good insight in Aragorn's mm. character because there's a lot he knows and there's a lot that he keeps secret. And he later in the book, when he has the engagement with uh, Gandalf and the Palantir, he, 
you know, Gandalf cautions him and says, hey, don't be too hasty. You know, you've waited long enough. You're at the end of the journey. Don't, you know, don't stumble here at the end. And so there's a sense in which Aragorn is a very patient, cautious, measured leader. Uh, and then Legolas notes of the, uh, the orcs, he says, it seems they delight to slash and beat down growing things right. that are not even in their way. Right. There's Once a lot again. of foreshadowing about what's going to happen here with the orcs and mm-hmm. what actually leads to their downfall is their delight in slashing and destroying things. Well, that reminds me of Paralandra where uh, Weston just, for no good reason, he grabs these Paralandrian frogs and dissects them with his Ugh. fingernail. Yeah. Ugh. And there's this kind of chilling hatred of natural growing things that you always associate with villainy yeah. in, in mm-hmm. Lewis and Tolkien. Mm-hmm. Now, Crystal, you're talking about signs and how uh, after, the, one of those laments, by the way, is almost directly an Anglo-Saxon genre. It paraphrases Anglo-Saxon. Oh, really? When Aragorn talks about Baramir, they will look for him and then they will not see him. Oh, wow. Mm. Uh, well, that's interesting you bring up signs because the very first spoken statement in this entire uh, book is, I read the signs aright, Aragorn said to himself. So he's thinking uh, he is interpreting what happened to Frodo, Mm. but then only three pages later, three or four pages later, they encounter um, all these dead goblin bodies And suddenly there's signs that he can't interpret. Upon their shields, they bore a strange device or sign, a small white hand in the center of a black field. And we're going to see that sign repeated multiple times. On the front of their iron helms was set an S rune. So the sign of an S wrought of some white metal. But now Aragorn says, what do they mean? And this begins a, a whole trajectory throughout this book about how do you read signs? How do you interpret signs? How do you interpret what is right to do? And I actually went, went through this whole book and discovered that the word sign is used 17 times in this book And as we proceed through the book, we can talk more about it. The difficulty of interpreting, is this good? Is this evil? And that goes back to what Aaron just said about uh, the fact that choice isn't always clear cut. this This is true of the Christian life. Many of us just wish, oh, I wish God would just give me a sign what I'm supposed to do. It would be so much easier. Yeah. Um, Am I supposed to... Go hunt orcs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or where, right. or where did the hobbits go later on? They're trying to figure out what happened right. to the hobbits. Right. But once again, it shows Tolkien's brilliant subtlety as opposed to uh, a lot of fantasy where it's just so clear cut. Mm. This person is evil. This person is good. And even later on, we're going to discover that um, in this book that... Um, the that characters see this old man and mm. they interpret it as being Saruman and actually it is Gandalf. Yeah. So even being able to recognize someone they know really well. Friend from foe. Interpretation is not always easy, knowing what to do. And so you have to uh, join a community and mm. discuss and work together, which of course reflects Tolkien's commitment to the yeah. idea of community. Well, I was going to say in that chapter, uh, the the White Rider, which again we're skipping around here, but that's fine. Uh, in the White <laughs> Rider, uh, they they're trying to figure out the signs of the hobbits on the ground, and you know there's a struggle right. here, and there's some chords, and what's going on, and they each take turns interpreting the yes. clues that they right. see and the riddles. And then they say something along the lines of, I think at one point Legolas says, well, that's my tale. What right. is your, what is right. your interpretation? And they disagree. Yeah. They but have different this, interpretations. They use the word tale, which I thought was a very interesting way of saying like, okay, I'm trying to weave together a narrative based on what I see, but I'm, I'm positive that this is not the whole story. What do you use? And then they want to compare notes as opposed to being like Sherlock Holmes, where he sees a few things and then he knows exactly what happened. 
happened um, with absolute certainty. You never see that in the story. Instead, you, like you said, Crystal, they have to compare notes. They have limited evidence. and But then often they have to make a decision based on mm-hmm. what they know at the time, knowing that they don't know the whole, the whole mm-hmm. truth. Yeah, that, that also comes up a lot. It was one of the few times you see explicit self-doubt on the part of, of Aragorn. He says, well, you give the decision to a, a bad decider because he says mm-hmm. all the decisions I've made since we came out of Lothlorien have not worked out well. Right. He says in the Riders of Rohan chapter, in the second chapter, um, this is Aemir, This is actually Aemir speaking. He says, uh, the world is all grown strange. And then he says, mm. uh, you know, elves and dwarves are walking together. And then he says, how shall a man judge what to do in such times? Yes. And so I feel like that is a very uh, important theme in this third book is this idea that in these strange times where, as he says later, uh, songs have you know, walked into the world of men, you know, the things that we've told our children, you know, all of a sudden we're seeing Ents and the king that's been, you know, long rumored is now returned with Anduril and things like that. In these strange times, how do you figure out what to do and how do you figure out to live? And I feel like that's a very relevant theme uh, for today. But give give, uh, Aragorn's answer to that question. Eomir says, how do we judge Mm. in these strange times? And he says, we judge as we've always judged. He says, as ever has judged, said Aragorn. Good and ill have not changed since yesteryear. Yes. It is a man's part to discern them as much in the golden wood as in his own house. Right. Right. Yeah. I like that answer. Because in some ways he's saying it's it's not, it's difficult, but it's not relativistic. Good and evil are still. The truth doesn't change, but how we interpret good or evil might change. Context changes the way we interpret Mm. reality. And that is what Tolkien is getting at. And that's what adds richness to all these various encounters that the walkers have. And it becomes more difficult. And I wonder if the reason Tolkien repeats this word signs and having to interpret the signs and disagreeing about the signs is they've been split up in three groups now. Uh, so you don't have the fellowship of the ring anymore, yeah. this com- this interpretive community yeah. that helps you negotiate well, the they signs. Be- they begin the quest and they rely a lot on Gandalf and Gandalf is removed in the beginning of this. And so they, they have to all of a sudden right. make their own decisions. It's sort of like growing up and your parents aren't there to make decisions for you anymore. But they also, in the beginning, they have a simple goal. And then it immediately gets thrown to the wayside. And now they have to adapt, you know. And it, it, it brings back Elrond's words of, hey, don't make any hasty promises. Because you don't know what's going to happen. And you don't know what situations you're going to find yourself in. And you'll have mm-hmm. to respond accordingly. Well, that comes up again. Gimli says, boy, Gandalf's plan certainly didn't work. Boy, he had the, he had the, <laughs> he had the wrong idea of yeah. how to do this. Yeah. Right. And uh, Aragorn kind of scolds him and says, well, nobody has the total foresight. All you can do is take yeah. the information you have and move forward. Yeah. Right. Um, well, speaking I, I, of moving forward, let's let's yes. <laughs> uh, let's get on the road. So we get the two chapters on sort of the Urukai. We see Merry and Pippin get carried off by the orcs and the Urukai, and then we we get a chapter on the Riders of Rohan. And this is essentially, uh, you know, the the orcs are running towards Isengard, and the uh, the three Gimli, Legolas, and Ar- Aragorn are trying to pursue them. And so it's a lot, you know, long journeying chapter. Is there anything that we want to mention out of those two chapters? I wanted to mention um, the signs of uh, moral growth in terms of Merry and Pippin. Oh, okay. in the, in, they've been totally passive up till now. They're just yeah. passengers. In fact, mm-hmm. one of them says, I'm just luggage. Right, right. <laughs> but the idea of throwing out the, the, uh, the little pin, the elf pin. Yeah. Which becomes a, great, a sign. Which becomes a sign mm-hmm. for them. Uh, and the whole idea of saying Gollum in your throat and making Grishnok think that maybe the, the ring is on yeah. them somewhere. Yeah. Mm. So this is the first time we see them showing a lot of initiative. Yeah. They yes. also have a certain amount of humor about what they're going through. It yeah. kind of shows what hobbits are like. They talk about the nearest bed and breakfast and all that kind of thing. <laughs> yes. And Gandalf says later on that they, they recover very quickly. Right. I um, mean, they're very sturdy, hobbits are. They're yeah. very resilient. Well, and I was going to say, when they're being carried, uh, there's this moment where they get some Lembus, and it says, uh, often in their hearts, they thank the Lady of Lorien for the gift of Lembus, for they could eat of it and find new strength, even as they ran. Sorry, that's not the hobbits. That's uh, Aragorn and Gimli and them. Right. Uh, but that mention of the gift of Lembus, and then the hobbits, they do when they they stop and they cut their bonds, they stop and they eat of the lumbus and it gives them strength and they remember the Lady of Lorien. So there's just that mention almost of like a spiritual element 
Yeah, we've talked about that before. It also comes up with the fact that writers of Rowan think the Lady of the Golden Wood is evil. She's some yeah. kind of a right. witch. Once again, yeah. in tr- different right. interpretations. And this aligns also with um, these early chapters where we discover, and the Mary and Pippin are in the middle of it, that orcs don't agree. And so you have orcs fighting orcs. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's right. why they're able to get away because the orcs are bent on killing each other it just depends Mm. who they're aligned with yeah well it reminds me of what you talked about on the last episode david about uh in the well in world war ii how the axis they didn't share their plans and they kind of acted on their own you see that bear out in this story where when when evil characters do something for their own good and they're not thinking there's no plan you know it's not like saruman and and uh Sauron are, are coordinating their attacks, you know, so Saruman is looking to solidify his own power. And then this one orc carries Marion Pippin off because he thinks he's going to get the ring for himself. And that that, you know, leads to their right. escape. And so when these evil characters do something that's selfish and uh, looking out for themselves, it inevitably leads to their their mm. failure, or their defeat. Right. Now, it's, by way of contrast, when uh, Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas meet the, the writers of Rowan, it almost starts out very badly because, yeah. Uh, Yamir says something bad about the Lady of the Wood. Right. And oh, Gimli gets They don't very know how upset. to interpret the Riders of Rowan. Right. They think they're enemies and then yeah. discover, because they had to take the time to discover, no, we share the same vision. And once again, uh, it's Aragorn who says, would you not hear our tale before you strike? He doesn't say, here's yes. what's really going on. Yeah. yeah. I've got the truth. You guys don't. <laughs> yeah. Here's our tale. Yeah. And I like how... Ymir says, well, three people on foot chasing orcs. You don't know much about orcs. <laughs> and Aragorn says, you're talking to the wrong person. I know a lot. Of-. But he doesn't react uh, de- defensively. Yeah. He says, well, they took our friends and this is the best we can do. Yeah. And you see him win Ymir's a- confidence and his respect. Mm. He has a moment almost like the transfiguration where he says, well, who yeah. are you exactly? You know, Strider doesn't sound like a real name. I am Aragorn. And suddenly the wind blows and you can yeah. see his sword, Andril. Yeah. And uh, even uh, Gimli and Legolas go, whoa, this guy is some kind of a transcendent yeah. king. Yeah. You see that also when they show up uh, at um, Theoden's house and Theoden's hall. And, and he's, you know, sort of proclaims who he is to the the guard the guardsman and right. he's like he's like whoa whoa you know wait, wait, you're, you're that guy from the story and you have that famous sword and yeah, yeah you know right. it's another thing you touched on i wanted to go back to is the uh the difficulty between reality and myth or legend or fantasy yeah the uh the other writers think that halflings or hobbits are <laughs> yes. you know ch- something from children's tales yeah. and he says yeah are we going to be hearing myths here in the light of day on the green grass and Aragorn says, sometimes something can be both. It can be a myth, but it can be something that is real in the light of yeah, day. Yeah. The same thing happens with ants. We right. yeah, discover yeah. Right. this tree that picks up Mary and <laughs> Pippin. And um, so we as readers realize, oh my goodness, there are trees that do talk and walk. But then in the next chapter, the I think it's... Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas mm-hmm. talking about the fact, oh, yeah, there was this old myth about yeah. trees that right, could move, right. and they discount it. But until you have the experience, and, and experience changes you. Yeah. So uh, Treebeard encounters um, Marion Pippin, uh, and I thought it was neat that he included this sort of children's rhyme or story about... Uh, the, the people, and then later on the hobbits are added to it. And so I was just going to mention, he, he says, learn now the lore of the living creatures. And then he goes through and he names them. Eldest of all, the elf children, dwarf, the dweller, darker as houses, and earthborn, old as the mountains, man, the mortal, master of horses. And so the mm. hobbits are not included in that. And because so they even have to add tre- it, right. Yeah, so even Treebeard doesn't know about the hobbits. So it's interesting you have sort of these unknown creatures meeting this other unknown creature, and they somehow get along. Right, well, right. Uh, and I wanted to mention that is another Anglo-Saxon genre. Oh, really? Is the inventory of creatures. Oh. And so, and even all the alliteration in that. Yeah, Beaver the Builder, Buck the Leaper. Uh, yeah, good. Yeah, Hobbit the Hairy Feet. Is that what he said? No, <laughs> that wasn't it. Half-grown Hobbits. Oh, half-grown oh, Hobbits. Well, there's the alliteration. Well, the inventory of living beings is Anglo-Saxon. Also, the word int itself means giant. It's the same word as etten in Anglo-Saxon. Oh, okay. Oh, I and just, tell them what you discovered 
about the name Tree Beard, David? Uh, we just acquired a book at the Wade Center that Lewis owned called uh, Heimskringla, which means the circle of the heavens in uh, Icelandic. Huh. And it's written by Snorri Sturlson, who wrote the Elder oh, Eddas and the okay. Poetic Eddas, which are the, all the, the old Icelandic tellings yeah. of Norse myth. We mentioned them in the last episode. Right. Snorri. right. Well, this yes. new book, uh, <laughs> yeah, Snorri Sturlson, it mentions a, a warrior named Treebeard, and there's also a dwarf named Durin. Whoa. So I think that uh, people have talked a lot about the Elder Eddas as a source for yeah. Tolkien. Yeah. But I believe this book, which is actually owned by C.S. Lewis, is also a source book for the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Uh, this is wow. one of the most exciting things the, the Wade has acquired. What is the name of this book? Well, I wish you hadn't asked me to say it again. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Heimskringla. Heimskringla. Yeah, which is based on the first few words. Uh, the very first words of the manuscript say, when the circle of the sun arose over the horizon. And so they took that as the title of this book. It's basically the legends and histories of Scandinavian kings and heroes. Oh, wow. It's not nearly as well known as the Eddas, but I can definitely tell that uh, Tolkien drew on that as well. Wow. Yeah. So do you think maybe like Tolkien borrowed the book or they've talked about it, I guess? Well, it's a real classic. The uh, underlinings in the book are by Lewis, uh -huh. but I'm positive that I'm still working on this for an article. So oh. uh, people out there in the podcast, please cover your ears. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to develop this more fully in an article. Oh, wow. Yeah. A teaser for that article. Oh, that's right. exciting, though. That's really well, neat. And because we have the book, we actually yeah. can look at C.S. Lewis's underlinings to know what stood out to him, which probably means he talked about it with Tolkien yeah. and other inklings. Oh, yeah. So it's it, very well, it's a, exciting. Yeah. Tolkien, Tolkien knew everything about Anglo Saxon and Norse legends. So it's oh, I'm sure. virtually impossible that he didn't know this book. Well, I was going to ask. So, uh, one of the things that we learn in this chapter as Mary and Pippin meet uh, Treebeard, well, they learn, they learn a lot, but uh, one of the things <laughs> that they learn is they, they hear this tale of the Entwives. And I wanted to ask uh, about the Entwives. Is there yeah. any sort of backstory to them? What's going on with that and the disappearance of the Entwives? And then in that section, I wanted to read this one passage because it just, it just blew me away. He said, but it seems that the wind is setting east and the withering of all woods may be drawing near. And so mm. there's this resignation in Treebeard that this may be the end. The Entwives are gone. There'll be no more Ents. This may be the last march of the Ents. But let's talk about the Entwives for just a second. What's going on there? There is a theory that um, the, Tolkien wouldn't like this. This is called the personal heresy. Uh -oh. uh, he and Edith had what they call a rescue marriage. They were both orphans. Uh, they met as very young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, as you know, um, mm -hmm. and Father Francis Morgan took uh, Tolkien under his wing, both brothers. He paid for some of their education. He would yeah. take them to holidays. But he forbade them to get married at such a young age. So oh. Tolkien had to wait till he was 21. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've talked about that to her. before. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, but after this extremely romantic and close bond, as they got older and had four children, she really sort of wanted him to evolve into a more domesticated husband. Oh. She liked gardening. She liked having uh, birds around the house and pets. And he liked wildness. He liked walking tours where nothing has oh. been cultivated or arranged. And so in later years, they always loved each other, but they didn't have quite the intimacy and closeness that they'd had in um, the early years of their marriage. Huh. And some people they didn't think have the, the philia that they, it's true. Lewis talks um, about in The Four Loves. But some people think that that longing for the Entwives reflects his own longing for the early days of their marriage when they were just so huh. uh, magnetically attracted to each other and so emotionally dependent on right. each other. Gotcha. But see, I'm sympathetic with Tolkien's wife because <laughs> here she has four children and he <laughs> is gone lecturing hanging out with his buddies at the Inklings yeah. and she's home taking care of the children, I think it makes sense that she would like more help yeah. from Tolkien. He's, he's out there coming up with names for orcs that get slain in like a <laughs> passing thought in a chapter. And I'm like, why, why does this guy even have a name? You know, just say that some orcs are coming to help them and then they got killed. But he's got a name in the book. It's like Mar, Mar or something. I can't yeah. remember. Oh. How he puts it in the this book is, but the Entwives gave their minds to the lesser trees. Yeah. Like she gave her mind. She spent all her time taking care of the children and rather than me. And this is 
from friends of mine who are counselors, they say this does become a a problem in marriages Mm. uh, where who takes care of the children, the children become a distraction from that original first love of their marriage. He caught up in little things. Right. Well, he actually, for the times, he was a pretty devoted father. But culturally speaking, that you think of that generation, the man is the breadwinner and the wife is the homemaker. And I think there's always a tension there. I think for his generation, he was very devoted. Later on, he and his uh, son Christopher came especially close. Christopher's the one who went to the Inklings meetings and read Tolkien's chapters. Later, he became the editor of all of the papers. Mm-hmm. At one point, uh, Tolkien said to Christopher, I'm writing the, the rest of Lord of the Rings for you. You are my audience. Right. Oh, wow. But he also told one of his sons, gave him advice about marriage and said, you have to be careful. You can't give in to your wife too much. Yeah, you have to make sure that you, your headship is is very clear. Interesting. Well, so I get, think some yeah, of that gotcha. autobiographical element Slipping is involved through. with the the Antwives. Okay, and there's no think, like Anglo Anglo Saxon story about you know female trees that. No, I don't know of any source for that. I wonder okay. if Edith read it and say, "Are you saying I'm an ant wife? Is, <laughs> is that where you're going with this material?" Well, uh, I wanted to mention a quote uh, from the Treebeard chapter, and then we can get back to talking about uh, the narrative. So Treebeard lamenting what the orcs have done, and this leads up to the uh, awakening of the Ents. And he says, some of the trees they just cut down and leave to rot. Orc Mm -hmm. mischief that. And then he says, curse him, root and branch. Many of those trees were my friends. Creatures I had known from nut and acorn. Many had voices of their own that are lost forever now. And then he says, I have been idle. I have let things slip. It must stop. Uh, and then he, he gets, you know, oh, it must not be too hasty. It is easier to shout stop than to do it. And so they go and they have an ent moot and they get all wound up. And we meet some more characters. Uh, Quick Beam, I think is his name. Right. Uh, and eventually the ents march off to Isengard. Um, is there anything you guys wanted to mention about that before we move on? I wanted mm-hmm. to mention their names are all very tree-like. Oh, yeah. Leaf lock means the locks of your hair are made of leaves. Oh, okay. One of his names uh, Skin Bark. <laughs> quick, beam, quick beam beam is an old word for uh we talk about a beam of wood but yeah it's an old yeah word beam for in the house wood and quick means living like the quick and the dead oh okay so he's a, it's a living tree a living piece of wood oh okay and the, later on we meet beach bone so i like how all the trees have these very tree-ish names yeah yeah, yeah. and when later aragorn and gimli and gandalf are talking about this amazing story of the Ents. They didn't realize it was true. Gimli says, you speak of him, which is Treebeard, as if he was a friend. I thought Fangorn was dangerous. Even how the same character mm. has different names. Yeah. He, so everybody's got more individuals than one have more than one sign yeah. attached to them. Aragorn introduces himself at one point, when Ermir comes up as Strider, you know, they, yeah. they have these different names that they use in different contexts. Do you know but, what Fangorn means? No. It means tree beard. It literally, oh, means, it literally means beard, in Anglo-Saxon? beard tree. No, in Elvish. Oh. Orn means tree, like Celeborn meant silver tree. Oh. The Huorns are the wild trees. They're kind of uh, the, the, the uh, ones that help destroy the orcs. Right. Fang, fang means... Fang means beard, beard, so it means beard tree. Oh. Huh. So after... Gimli says, I thought Fangorn was dangerous. Once again, this is back to how do you interpret these things? And Gandalf says, dangerous, and so am I. Very dangerous. More dangerous than anything you will ever meet. And it reminded me of what C.S. Lewis does in the Narnia Chronicles when the children are talking about Aslan and they say, of course he isn't safe. In other words, he's dangerous. But he's good. Yeah. Which is exactly the point about Gandalf. Yeah. And doesn't he also say, and you're dangerous? Doesn't he say that to Gimli? And Aragorn is dangerous. You are dangerous yourself. Yes. He goes on. Yeah. It's interesting how he he redefines that term. Right. Reminds me of, you're the man. No, you're the man. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I was going to mention, we also learn in this chapter that the trolls are counterfeits of trees 
right? Uh, just as orcs are counterfeits of elves, and then uh. you have sort of the orokai that are a counterfeit of men and elves. And so uh, it's interesting that Tolkien includes that that the enemy can create things, but they're only bad or counterfeit copies of the real thing. Which is very uh, Augustinian. Oh, yeah, very yes. much Jerry so. Jerry Rootwood here, he would remind us that you can't think of a, a uh, bad banana without thinking of a good banana. <laughs> yes. That these, right. Yeah, these orcs are spoiled ints, and the Balrog is actually a spoiled yeah. Mayar. Uh, I was also going to mention, this is just a prose insight that I had starting in this chapter. I wrote at the top of the page three word sentences with an exclamation point. Tolkien really doubles down on this pattern through the this first book, book three. Uh, and I, I went back and looked and he, he does it in, in The Fellowship of the Ring and it's a very common thing. But he'll have paragraphs where, you know, people are saying long flowery things. And then when he really wants to focus your attention or drive home a point or have a very exclamatory statement come from somebody that comes across as powerful, he'll use, I mean, sometimes he'll use one word sometimes two words, but those are very hard to come by. But if you think about it, a three-word sentence itself is also very hard to write. And so there's a passage here. He says, gray dusk fell, Pippin looked behind. And then it goes on in the next the next chapter. And so there's a lot of those passages where he'll go for a very long time, and then it's like he's taking a breath into in his prose, and he just has these three-word sentences. And it's a thing that he does throughout the story. And so it just stood out to me. I, it just showed me the sort of mastery that he has of the English language in his yeah. writing. Yeah, Bormir did that when he was dying. He said, I, I tried to take the ring. I am sorry. I have paid. Those yeah. are his right, last words. Right. Yeah. But that that stands in contrast, then, what Treebeard tells us, that to communicate anything, you need a long story. (laughs) And he has that wonderful comment where someone mentions a hill, and he says, well, that's a hasty word for something that took hundreds, if not thousands of years to make. And so it's Treebeard is rebelling against this short type of descriptive style. In a lot of Aboriginal languages, you have extremely long words. They won't just give a designation. They'll give a whole description of something in the word. And uh, in uh, English, it looks like it's 20 or 25 letters. Yeah. I, I want to tell a slight digression about uh, Bormir's last words. Oh, I was okay. talking to a student. Yeah. I said, what is your favorite passage in The Lord of the Rings? And she said, I love it when Boromir's dying. And he says, I would have followed you, my brother, my captain, my king. And I said, yeah, that is a great line, but it's in the movie. It's not in the book. (laughs) So it's kind of sad that her favorite line of the whole Lord of the Rings was not in the book. Well, okay, so that actually relates to a theme that I do, I did see in this chapter. I wanted to mention it. It is to me, it's a very clear biblical illusion. So there's a moment between Legolas and Gimli uh, in the chapter of the White Rider where they're sort of discussing their friendship and then eventually they make a promise that they're going to come back and visit Fangorn together and they're going to visit mm, right. the caves of, of Helm's Deep. And Gimli, he says, you are a wood elf anyway, though elves of any kind are strange folk, yet you comfort me. And then he says, where you go, I will go. Oh, oh interesting. And like Ruth. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly what Ruth says. I was like, that that was in my wedding vows that me and my wife said. Wow. And so here he makes this vow and he's literally saying, where you go, I will go. I will follow you. Um, and then that's repeated uh, in a number of times. Follow us. Let us go. We will go. You know, I will follow you. And that's that's it keeps re- being being repeated. But I thought to me that was a very significant moment in the story because Legolas and Gimli's relationship, Peter Jackson makes a big deal of it in the movie and rightly so. But, you know, later on they have the battle at Helm's Deep and they're competing over who kills more orcs and those kinds of things and their friendship deepens. But to me, I felt like that was a key turning point where he says, where you go, I will go, Mm. uh, alluding to Ruth uh, and uh, that biblical illusion there. And they both say, you comfort me to the other. Yeah. Uh, in different passages. I mean, so, yeah, that's it's a fascinating uh, look at friendship. Right. Uh, that with, surmounts prejudice and Right. They have ethnicity. to learn to like each other. Uh, or species, beginning. we should say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, as long as we're talking about that biblical illusion, we need to discuss Gandalf's resurrection. Yeah, Gandalf right. comes back. Right. Right. And uh, they do not recognize him right away, which right. definitely right. F- brings to mind the road to Emmaus and Jesus yes. is walking with right. the disciples and, and they don't immediately recognize him until he breaks bread. 
Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. They think he might be Saruman because, and he says, well, I am Saruman as he was meant to be. He was Gandalf the Grey. Writers are fascinated by his description of his battle with the Balrog. Mm. It seems, oh, yeah. He seems to have cast down the dragon. So they're in hell. It's almost like Gandalf's descent into hell. Yeah. But then they climb this spiral staircase and it's almost Dantean. They get up on the top yeah. of a mountain and then he throws the Balrog down. So the whole thing has these kind of Christ-like overtones uh, of the descent into hell and the destruction of, of almost, Satan. Yeah, it's almost like Jesus and Satan fighting or something. Right. Right, yeah. right. Uh, well, and that is old, old tradition. Or Michael and right. Right. Satan. Right, Michael and the dragon. First Peter 3.19, of course, is that interesting verse that kind of um, generated the whole idea of the harrowing of hell, mm. where it says that... Jesus went down to prison and preached among the prisoners there. And in medieval drama, and of course, Tolkien is very familiar with medievalism, they wrote plays about the harrowing of hell, where Jesus goes down to hell, and this is the day after the crucifixion. So it's referred to, we talk about Good Friday, but um, Roman Catholics would talk about Happy Saturday, because yeah. that is the day Jesus preached to those who had never heard of him before, mm. which is a very fascinating idea insofar as we would assume hell is outside of time. So that yeah. would be all humans who died without knowing Christ. So it's like they're given a last chance to accept Jesus as their Savior. Yeah. And in a famous medieval play called The Harrowing of Hell that comes out of Wakefield, England, Jesus confronts Satan and Beelzebub and to draw all these people out of hell. And he says to Satan and Beelzebub, let my people pass. And it's the exact same line that in the Yorkshire play about the children of Israel fleeing Egypt, Moses says to Pharaoh, let my people pass. Hmm. Hmm. Well, uh, someone actually asked Tolkien about this. As you know, he didn't want to be explicitly Christian. Right. He wanted the, as he says, the, the Christian It's symbolism. not allegorical, definitely. Yeah. yeah. He said it's a giant symbolism which never breaks out into allegory. Someone asked yeah. him about uh, Gandalf as a Christ figure, and he said, oh, what Christ did in saving all of humanity is infinitely more important than what mm. my, my imaginative figure could mm. do in Middle Earth. Of course. Yeah. So he didn't want you to push that too hard, but you still can't help but feel the echoes of going yeah. all the way down, climbing the staircase. It definitely rhymes. Pipe. Yeah, it definitely yeah. rhymes. Well, they reunite with Gandalf and they get on their horses. Shadowfax shows up with uh, these other horses and they ride to Theoden's Hall and they get to Theoden's Hall. I was going to mention, Crystal, you said that line. Gandalf actually says that uh, to the, the gatekeeper. He says, now let me pass. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh. they get there, they meet Theoden. Um, we have this confrontation with Wormtongue and Mm. And uh, Theoden is sort of released, and then they they journey on to Helm's Deep. Is there anything that we wanted to mention in that section before we talk about Helm's Deep, which is kind of the big event in this first yeah. book? I wanted to mention more Anglo-Saxon. Uh, Hama, who's there at the door, means home. He's the captain of the guard. Uh huh. And uh, Grima means worm. And they call him Worm Tongue. Okay. When he calls uh, Gandalf Lath Spell, that means bad news. Literally, Lath. Oh is the same root as our word loathing. So he oh, okay. says, I call you laugh spell. You're always bringing bad news. Oh. So once again, we're getting a lot of Anglo-Saxon. It's also interesting to chart the moral ascent and the moral descent of various characters. Oh, yeah. Uh, because... Theoden started out in pretty bad shape. Yeah. His name means chief of the people or head of the people. Yeah. But he's been totally seduced by Wormtongue's lies and he's very yeah. confused. But he's going to recover from that and become really an admirable character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting parallel with Denethor, whom we're going to meet later. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in this uh, epic story, is there's a lot of individual storylines. Gollum probably goes the furthest down in his mm -hmm. journey. Uh, but Theoden is one of those happy stories that he ha undergoes moral recovery. He shakes off the, the bad influence of, yeah. of Wormtongue and, and really mm -hmm. uh, becomes an ally. I would say of Theoden Gandalf. and Faramir almost have two of the most, and then maybe Eowyn have two of the most uh, sort of positive character arcs. Uh, and it's interesting that they're all 
um, you know, they're all, they're not the center, you know, they're not Aragorn, they're not uh, Gandalf, right. mm. but they have very positive uh, character arcs. Mm. I keep bringing up Anglo-Saxon. Eowyn means friend of horses or uh. it's the same root as winsome. Eo yeah, means uh. horse and the win part means, remember, uh, well, Edwin Ransom in uh, Paralandra, the, the angel yeah. tells him his name means friend of elves. Uh, well, so I love it when Gandalf sees Wormtongue and sitting at the feet of Theoden you know, and obviously having is pulling Theoden down and he confronts him saying, down snake, he said suddenly in a terrible voice, down on your belly. And it uh-huh. can't help but I mean, yeah. remind you of Genesis the snake in the Garden of Eden. Right. Yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Well, and I was also going to mention before we move on from uh, the King of the Golden Hall chapter is when uh, Theoden leaves, he, he wants to leave somebody in charge of his household. Yes. And he, he says, oh, who am I going to leave in charge? And I, I, again, another three word sentence. He says, which of you will stay? He says, no man spoke. Uh, and uh. then he says, is there none in the house? And then they, they go around and then eventually he says, you know, Aymer. And uh, anyways, the, it basically says she is fearless and high hearted. All love her. Let her be as Lord to the Aerolingus while we are gone. So uh, Tolkien does a really good job of highlighting Eowyn, her character, setting up, obviously, her, yes. uh, her story later. It makes up for the ant wives. It does. <laughs> it does. But I, again, using those three word, and said, three word sentences, he sort of very powerfully declares like, you know, who's going to stay here? No man spoke. But then Eowyn steps up and is willing to take the take response. Sometimes in rhetoric books, they'll have a whole paragraph that's kind of dull and uh, doesn't have much impact. And they'll say, did you notice that every single sentence in that paragraph was eight words? And they'll give you another paragraph and it'll be much more the long sentence, the long, and then suddenly a real short, concise sentence. Yeah. And he does that naturally all the way through. I think a sentence variation, good writers just intuitively know that you can't mm. just keep coming back, you know, with the exact same construction. Oh, yeah. He also does, he likes passives. Often he says, gray were their beards and strong were their hands. Yes. And he loves to turn it around and give it this He loves to flavor. describe people that way. And right. it, there's a, a, a poetry and a rhythm. There's a symmetry to right. reading it. You just want to keep reading the next statement. It works very well. In the Helm's Deep chapter, next uh, the next thing he says, evening came behind. The host rode on. Need drove them. Mm. And so uh, you just, it's uh, just, you know, there's this rhythm to those three word and four word sentences as he puts them together. Mm. Well, let's get to uh, Helm's Deep. We kind of need to get moving ourselves. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about what happens at Helm's Deep. I mentioned uh, Legolas and Gimli's competition over how many orcs they kill. Mm-hmm. That bothers some people. We're going to have to talk later about the moral nature of, of orcs. Oh, okay. Uh, I want to write an article sometime called Do Trolls Have Souls? Oh, that would be good. Yeah. Orcs and trolls seem to have no existence except to be warriors who need to be killed. This is true. Yeah. But occasionally, as we get further on in the story, the we're going evil. to talk about how even accidentally Tolkien kind of humanizes them. Really? Uh, they do have certain traits. Well, let's wait till okay. a later book. All right. It bothers some people that they're having this contest of how many they kill. Oh, okay. It seems a little, I wouldn't say dehumanizing. I have to say de-orcizing. Uh, okay. They're surprised that someone who went through World War I can take such a casual view of how many mm. enemies you're killing. But he does give you orcs. If you look at some World War I posters, they talk about the Hun, and there's these big hairy creatures yeah. with long arms and claws and fangs. Yeah. And some people think his orcs draw upon mm. World War I propaganda yeah. of what the enemy well, was like. But I would oh, say, I would there's say. There's actually iconography that shows troll like oh, yeah. images to portray the Germans yeah. right. in right. Um, the posters, the recruiting posters. Yeah. Posters, yeah. Well, American posters. I was going to say, I, I feel like Tolkien's, and there, there actually have been a number of academic articles written on this, but uh, Tolkien's imagery of of war and his sort of morality surrounding war feels very pre 20th century. Um, it almost feels ancient in the sense like that like Anglo Saxon, Anglo Saxon, in <laughs> yeah. the sense that and medieval, yeah, in the sense that there can be a glory to war, even though it involves horrible things and you know leaves piles of bodies behind. There's there can be a uh, you can act um, honorably in war, even in killing people, uh, which is not a thing that we tend to think about today. That's not how we tend to think of war. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. these warriors had a certain amount of control. There was individual heroism. There was individual skill in battle. It's not sitting in a stinky trench with the water up to your knees and yeah. rats being shelled by somebody yeah. from a but half he, a mile away. But he does depict some of the 
aspects of war that they don't even show in the movies. You know, the they make the men uh, that help, you know, that fought against them, they make them pile up the dead bodies, and there's this big giant pile of orc oh, bodies, right, and they right. don't know what to do with it. And um, and so he does, you know, he depicts that sort of rough, gross, disgusting parts of war of like, you know, carrying the dead bodies and putting them in a pile and burning them right. and scattering their ashes and the kind of stuff they don't show in movies, but is the sort of... Uh, the horror. Yeah, the horror of the war, horror, you know? But I like the economy of the ints and the, the trees and the huorns just sort of devouring the orcs. You don't really see what happens. Like, whatever <laughs> happened true. to the enemy? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No problem with the prisoner of war camps or anything like that. They just they kind just of put of, them in a hole and yeah. put some rocks over it. And, and, mm-hmm. Yeah, disappear, yeah. I think it's Helm's Deep didn't strike me as uh, very interesting, especially compared to when they proceed from there. So they win the war with the the orcs, and now they make their way to Isengard. Isengard. They have to pass through this crazy, creepy forest, which we learn are the, as you said, David, the the Huorns, these Ents that have fallen asleep. Uh, and are shepherded by the actual Ents. And there's that interesting moment as they're leaving and Legolas turns around and sees eyes. And then here come the Ents and they talk to them. But they make their way to Isengard. Uh, you were going to say, Crystal? I was, oh. No, I, was, I just well, want to talk uh, about it. Yeah, well, when let's they talk get about there, it. They discover Merry and Pippin. Yeah. And they're sitting around uh, oh, smoking right. and drinking and enjoying <laughs> the spoils of war. Uh, yeah. Those speeches where uh, the silver-tongued Saruman, first he thinks he can turn Theoden to his side and say, yeah. oh, let's be yes. friends. It's a, it's all a misunderstanding. Yes. And when he fails with Theoden. evocative language that is attractive. And very eloquent, but almost uh, like the silver-tongued devil. Right. Uh, there's six complete drafts of that passage. Tolkien Ooh. really wanted to get it right. He wanted oh, wow. to get the idea that first Saruman is going to try to use his eloquence to sway Theoden, and then he's going to try to use his eloquence. He loves the suspense of people looking on, kind of going, is he going to turn? Is he going to abandon us? And yeah, he actually side, has. have an alliance of wizards? He and, has that moment in, in Theoden's mind where he goes, uh-oh, are they going to go go off and talk, these two adults, and we're going to sit out here yeah. like kids while they right. decide our fate? Right. And then it you know, it snaps in a moment, and he's yeah. brought back to reality. Yeah, mm. there's always this moment at which you realize mm. the good person will not be tempted, yeah. will not succumb. And so here is Saruman in his tower, this dark tower, uh, and he has Wormtongue with him. So it becomes very clear that Wormtongue was just Saruman's toady who was trying to pull Theoden down and was doing a good job. But uh, Wormtongue is so evil that he takes a precious object from Saruman, this crystal globe, and throws it Yes, out of the tower seeking to hit uh, Gandalf and Aragorn, is it? Um, well, he's just trying to drive away people. But he's not sure which one he hates more, uh, right. Gandalf or Saruman. So right. <laughs> he just throws and, it down. Yeah. And he's thinking more of himself, which yeah. is a, the ultimate sign of evil, where you put yourself above all other yeah. characters. Well, and and once again, that act, that's an act of betrayal of Saruman, because that's yeah. a very valuable seeing right. stone. Well, right. I was going to say, uh, there's an encounter that uh, Gandalf has with Treebeard as they're leaving that revealed a lot, uh, because the first time I read this, I thought, why are they trying to reason with Saruman? Just destroy him or, you know, bring him out and, you know, you know, I don't know, ch- chain him up and throw him in a pit or something. Like, why Why are they Why are they just letting him hang out in this tower? Because as we learn later in the story, you know, he rears his head. And so there's this moment with Treebeard, and he says, this is um, Gandalf talking to Treebeard about Saruman. He says, great service he could have rendered, but he has chosen to withhold it and keep the power of our Orthanc. He will not serve, only command. And it, it stood out to me that Tolkien is trying to, I think, once again, reinforce what power does to the human heart. Right. Is you can become so obsessed with power that you refuse to serve, that you will only command, and you are unable then to actually use the gifts and the skills that you have that God has given to you for, to help other people because you only want people to help you. And it, it actually leads you uh, to this horrible place. And so he says about um, Saruman, unhappy fool, he will be devoured. And then mm. later on he says, often does hatred hurt itself. Mm-hmm. And so there's this sense in which he was going to make him o- his own self miserable because he refused to render the service that he could. He could be of great help against 
Sauron still if he would only turn, but he refuses to repent. But there is something good in Saruman that could be redeemed if only he would turn. Well, yeah, moral choice. There's a line in Milton where Satan says, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Yeah. And I think Saruman has that attitude. I like this kind of uh, benevolent providence. Tolkien never uses the word providence, but when uh, Wormtongue is impulsive and throws down the seeing stone, that's a major advantage to the good guys. Now Eric yeah. can use that. They can find out what's yeah. going on. But when, is it Merry or Pippin who tries to look into the Pippin. seeing stone? Pippin. We're going to find out later that even though that was a foolish thing to do, and he did it almost to the great harm to himself, it has good effects. We're going to find out later that act of impulsiveness actually aided the allies, Aragorn yeah. and Gandalf. So there's this fascinating uh, suggestion that somehow there's a, a subtle providence which is moving things forward in the yes. battle against mm. evil. And you see that when uh, Treebeard, in that same section, Treebeard says, well, well, things will go as they will, and there is no need to hurry to meet them. Right. Mm. And so there's this patience that you see in Treebeard and in Gandalf and in some of the wiser mm-hmm. and older characters where they realize there's times for haste and there's times for action, and then there's other times where we need to wait but things will progress as they're meant to, and we just need to be ready to respond when the time comes. Mm. Right, right. And to go back to an earlier conversation, in these last chapters, as the walkers are confronting Saruman in Orthanc, twice, within several pages of each other, Tolkien writes, Gandalf made no sign. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it is not as though even after Gandalf comes back from the dead, it's not clear cut. Oh, yeah. Well, mm. I was going to mention, uh, he, he actually says of, uh, now I have to find it. Um, I like how oh, they say Gandalf. And he goes, yes, that was my name. As if remembering he's been so transformed, he almost has to mm. recover the identity that he had before. Mm. Okay, here we go. Uh, Crystal, about Gandalf, after he comes back, Marion Pippin, Right before Pippin goes and he steals, steals the Palantir and puts a stone by right. it. Yes. So they're talking about him and there, there's something different about him since mm-hmm. he's come back from the dead. And it says he's grown or something. He can be both kinder and more alarming, merrier and more solemn than before. I think he has changed, but we have not had a chance to see how much yet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so there's this mm-hmm. implication that uh, there's almost more goodness in him, but with that perfection of goodness has come uh, a terror or a mm-hmm. seriousness. Of course a, a he solemnity. isn't safe, but he's good. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah right. And it definitely reminds and me of that he quote. gives no sign. Yeah. So they're having trouble interpreting his purposes yeah. and direction. Is he mad at us or is he, right. is he happy? Yeah. Right. Definitely. right. Uh, well, once again, he had been Gandalf the Grey, and now he's Gandalf the White. Right. So, so quite his literally, choices, he changes. He changes clothes. <laughs> well, he's yeah. been purified in kind of a purgatorial way, mm. whereas Saruman, who should have been the head of the order because of his selfishest decisions, now he's become demoted and trivialized, and he's not going to be a major player after this. Yeah, definitely. So the whole book then ends with them getting on horses and riding to Minas Tirith, So that's what we will be talking about in our next session. I love the closing passage as Pippin and Gandalf are riding through the night. Crystal, can you read the last paragraph of this book? As he fell slowly into sleep, Pippin had a strange feeling. He and Gandalf were still as stone, seated upon the statue of a running horse, while the world rolled away beneath his feet with a great noise of wind. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to the Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, fast collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.